Hi, I'm Brian Wagner from Wagner's Rose Nursery. Um, I'm the master agent for Bruce Brundrit uh, Roses, and this is Bruce Brundrit uh, here, and Bruce is just going to talk a bit about the history of the business and breeding. Well, I'm just a young fella, having been born in 1940. Uh, uh, in my grandfather started a rose nursery in 1893, but unfortunately he passed away just three or four months after I was born. Um, the nursery commenced down at Mooney Ponds within a couple of hundred metres of the Mooney Valley Racecourse oh, wow. on the yeah. creek there. And uh, he moved the nursery from there to Nary Warren North in uh, 1926 due to uh, problems with the town water supply, uh, lack of pressure, even though he was at the bottom of the hill. Um, so in those days, when uh, uh, getting the rose plants out of the ground for sale in the winter time. It was all done with a spade, no mechanisation at all. In fact, this was the case up until uh, uh, I think it, up until uh, nineteen. 58, 60, something like that. Mm. Uh, then we... Uh, oh, that's right. First of all, we had a winch digger. So a U-shaped blade on a sledge. Uh, it was put at one end of the row and a cable either side of the row that attached to the swingle tree there was a single cable to the winch. So the rows were only 100 feet long. We'd winch it down until the uh, uh, digger had passed the last plant. Then uh, it took about, it was pretty heavy, I think it took probably four men to carry it back to the other end again and repeat the process. Now this just cut the roots and uh, the plants were left in the ground and the lifter, so-called, would walk around the whole patch getting one of this and one of that and one of the other for orders. Um, so by today's standards, that was exceptionally uh, expensive way of doing it as far as labour was concerned. Uh, then we mechanised and had it mounted on a tractor, high clearance tractor, <coughs> connected to the PTO that shook the plants up as they were being, the roots were being cut. Uh, and then the plants would be all gathered up then and uh, uh, healed in. When, when did you do that, Bruce? What, what, uh, what year was the, so uh, the, it, it, the cutter blade with the shaker, roughly? Oh, um, with the shaker, that would have been... Hang on, I'm just trying to think. About 1961. Okay. That's maybe pretty early. 62. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's... Because uh, my parents back then were, were using, a, 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 again, a cable system um, yeah. and uh, undercutting, but it was more of a knife cut wasn't it? You know, like it was a lot yeah, harder to pull out. Yeah, it didn't out, shake you know? it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it was a lot easier with the shakers. Um, mm. Yeah. Around that time, we went to South Australia that a uh, ornamental tree nurseryman got mechanised, mechanised, and he had a U-shaped blade offset from the tractor. But because of the draft being offset, it had to be a very heavy tractor, mm. uh, otherwise it couldn't be controlled. And Father went to see this, and, uh, but didn't take that up. 
he, he, he uh, saw the winch diggers being used and uh, did that. We had to get a uh, contractor in that had a winch on his tractor. Okay, yeah. Only, only a little tra tractor was necessary. Um, yeah, so that's about it. But the big, big improvement was the tractor, pardon me, that the uh, uh, PTO shook the tines behind the blade and depending on the conditions, often the plants were 100% out of the ground. Yeah, they're yeah. much easier to pull up, aren't they? Yeah. So, um, so the, the property, so when you took over the business, so what, what year was that when oh, you started sort of running? Uh, not exactly. My, <laughs> I didn't take over the business legally. Okay. <laughs> not that I did it illegally. Yeah. But um, you started running my, my father became extremely unwell in his later years but still came out to the nursery each day, even though he wasn't able to do anything. Uh, so I'd say, uh, let me think, 62. Yeah, he, he, uh, he ceased coming out to the nursery in about nine, uh, 19, nine. Just thinking, um, he, he, well, he stopped coming out to the nursery several years before we closed it down, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Maybe five years. So, so 2002 minus five or six years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Back yeah. back in the mid 90s or something like that. Yeah. So it's uh, Possibly. yeah yeah. Uh, but you were pretty much you, you were running the business over oh, before yes. that though. You know, yeah. Well so. before. Um, with, with your wife. When Shirley. I came oh. into the business, father said, you look after production, I'll look after the office. Okay, right. yeah. <laughs> That worked pretty well. Yeah. Um, but uh, in addition to the nursery rose plants, we had oh, several acres of established rose plants, three feet apart and six feet between the rows uh, for cut flowers. We had even yeah. been doing cut flowers, I don't know, but a few years before World War II. Oh, wow, okay. Mother kept that going during the war, and when father returned from uh, his military service, um, we went on until about 1962, the roses would be packed in timber boxes with ice at the broken up ice at the bottom end, and they were taken to the Narrywarren railway station and put on uh, passenger rail to Melbourne, and then a carrier picked them up in Melbourne and distributed to the suburban florists. And we got out of that, doing it that way in about, oh, again, early 60s, and um, tracked them to Melbourne ourselves. So how many, how many flowers would you be cutting each, each day? Would it be every day oh, or second day? No, or no. Oh, well, yeah. you'd pick them every day. Yeah. Um, we talk, that, that would have been in bunches it, then, would that? Yeah, and bunched. And there'd be something like, to 200 or a bit more bunches, bunches. of length yeah. and then uh, very short stems about five inches for makeup work and pick up a hundred of them too. Okay, so, um, so you're talking, height, you're, you're talking we, two or three thousand, four thousand blooms a day most probably. Not that. Um, we, we had a, a waiting list to, yeah, we were deliver we were supplying roughly forty something florists. Wow. We had another twenty or thirty on the waiting list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a big, business big... was good. Yeah. And but about that time Glasshouse Roses just started to come in. Mm. 
but they didn't have much effect for another quite a few years, 60 to me, to about 1980, so, yeah. 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 Mm. It's, uh, again, my, my parents used to cut a lot of uh, uh, rose blooms too for the florist industry, but they, again, same thing, the glasshouse industry came in and uh, yeah. uh, and that industry pretty much disappeared overnight. Yeah. I think it's, uh, uh, but we, yeah, we used to cut, but there's a swing back to open field blooms again, I think, because people are wanting a bit more fragrance in uh, in a lot of the flowers that they yeah, get these days. So uh, there's definitely a swing back to um, open field blooms um, yeah. at the moment. So John that... Neal, while, whilst he's a big glass house producer of cut mm. roses, he also has a, a couple of varieties that he's planted extensively mm. uh, outdoors and the shoots that produce a truss of buds, mm. they go along and take the crown bud out mm. and then let the yeah, all the side, side shoots all break, yeah. mature and cut yeah. them and mm. oh the one he, he, he sells heaps of oh it's a terrible colour <laughs> <laughs> but anyway he's selling them but uh, yes uh, that was something new for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From from you know being a wholesale producer, you also uh, had a fairly big extensive well, retail industry for as well. Well, wholesale for the cut flower roses, yeah. but the uh, plants were all mail order retail. Okay. Uh, with very few callers in the fifties uh, and sixties. Uh, they all felt that Nerry Warren was far too far from the suburban Melbourne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they ha would have them mailed to them. But that changed in the following years, and we had a lot of people call it the nursery. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so from, from, from there, uh, so you, you retired out of the, uh, out of yes. the family business, Back in, in um, 2002. Two. And then from there you, you started breeding, right? Yeah, so shortly it's a, after. Yeah. yeah. So uh, um, Bruce would, would have to be the leading um, Australian uh, breeder, without a doubt. He's won quite a few awards. And uh, so, so, yeah, so you started breeding in, in 2002. When did you start, actually start selling some of your varieties, Bruce? What was one of your first varieties that you released um, onto the wholesale retail market? Do you remember? It was Shirley's. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, it's, um, it's still a Shirley's very... Rose was named after my late wife, mm. who passed away in 2012. Mm. Uh, but Shirley's Rose wasn't marketed for, I don't know, several years after that, mm. before it was on the market, yeah. So that gives you a bit of an idea how long it takes from when you first start breeding to how long yeah. it takes oh, to get yes. roses onto the market. There's, there's many Something years like of... Uh, four or five years of evaluation yeah. as to whether it's worth putting on the market. Sure. Yeah. It's a long-term uh, um, business, isn't it? It's, it takes a long time to... And, and even now, like we're, we're now looking at a lot of Bruce's varieties at the moment, and uh, um, you've really got to sit on them for three, four, five years to really get a good idea on, on whether you feel that they're good enough to... Uh, to release for the for the market, you know, you've got to be fairly certain that they're very good plants. We're, we've got at the moment, Bruce, haven't we? We've most probably got what 40, 50 of your varieties that we're looking at oh, at the present, at least. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of varieties that will be coming out in the future uh, of Bruce's. He's um, you're the only Australian um, breeder to ever win um, um, a, a gold medal rose from the Australian oh, National Trial Gardens. Um, um, wouldn't say we're the only one, but. Yeah, well, they're, they're a, a couple well, no, no, of... no other Australian breeders got gold, have they? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, I couldn't tell you. No. I but think, there, I, there I are a the couple of... Bruce is the first. Yeah, so. a couple of <laughs> amateur breeders yeah. that do them in a... about it in a business-like way, and they have produced, I don't know, four or five high-quality... Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's... Uh, but you, you, you did very well a couple of years back uh, when you won your gold medal, didn't you? You, we, you, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't have the details clear in my head, but 
And we're talking about I now stacking the... up against all the world yes. rose breeders now. Okay, that, we're not talking from... about just uh, an, an old international no. breeder. We're talking about the likes of uh, Cordy's and the likes of uh, Mayons and Tantales the Del and, and the Telpan, the Tantale, yeah. the Dixons, uh, um, the, 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 the Austins. Yeah, um, Hartness, yeah. so on. Yeah. So now go on. To, anyway, to... one year, and I might not be relating this exactly, but I got the best rose in the trials, a gold medal, an award for fragrance, one and an award. two or three other awards that are, uh, how shall we say, um, that come from New Zealand and so on. Well, um, recognition. Yeah. We're talking yeah, about here. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, anyway, in this year, uh, the rose major overseas breeders didn't do any good at all. I won virtually every award, uh, and uh, in this particular year, one of the very big breeders from overseas gave us a talk on uh, at the what do you call it the National Rose Trial at the Rose Trials Awards night mm -hmm. uh, as to how many crosses they made in a year and so on. And it was extremely high numbers, but in this particular year, his entry didn't get any recognition at all. Mm. Yet small time me. <laughs> yeah, and you can be very lucky sometimes, I yeah. think, but it's just but knowing. But I think that the next year I didn't get anything. <laughs> yeah, sure, and, and it happens yeah, that way, doesn't yeah, it, yeah. you know? So it's, uh, um, but that was an exceptional year for, it was. for you. Right. It was, uh, um, it was pretty exciting. I, was, I happened to be sitting next to you that, uh, that evening, oh, Bruce. Yeah. Um, did some no, of it rub off, did it? Well, <laughs> but no one could see you from the other side because of all the trophies, so it was... Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, a, oh, it was a great... And, and great these game. trophies, some of them are... Oh, what, silver bowls, you know, with a handle either side and yeah, so on. Yeah, they're big. But you don't get no. to keep them. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're so. like half an hour later after they've been awarded to you and a few, few photographs taken, they go back into the vault. <laughs> but your name's on on those yeah, uh, yeah. those trophies. That's that's the main thing. Hey? So it's uh, so yeah. So uh, and and you know like we're, 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 there's some very exciting um, uh, roses that are going to be released over the next two or three years of, uh, of Bruce's uh, varieties. So we're, we're we are uh, as Wagners um, very excited about some of those varieties that are going to be coming out, uh, and that will be announced in the next uh, uh, the next year or two. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of material at the present that we can certainly be working with and uh, so hopefully there will be uh, Bruce's name and his varieties will be uh, yeah. will be getting released for, for, for quite a few years from now on. So, As so I said, from, uh, from now. my first release was named after my late wife several years after she passed away and coming up, I don't know, about two or three years or something from now, is one named after my granddaughter. Hmm. Uh, which is being released this year. Is which, it? Which is Jessica's oh. Rose. Yeah, right. Yes. And uh, we're doing a soft release with that this year. Um, it's, it's out there to all the other growers, so there'll be quite a major release next year. Um, so yeah, so that will be, uh, uh, that, that will actually be on the market this year, Bruce. Mm. Nice right. girly colours. It's a lovely rose, <laughs> very free flowering plant. We're yeah. really happy with it. I think it's going to be a great selling rose. So it's, uh, it's an ex excellent plant. But we're just going to talk about now um, on how we hybridize and how we breed roses. So it's a, it's a, it's a quite a complex um, way of, well, yes or no, um, mm. but there's quite a bit of time involved in, in the breeding of roses. So Bruce is just going to tell us a little bit about how, how he came about and how he breeds roses and some of his favorite roses that he's bred. Well, we had mother plants, which are in very big pots under what I call a gazebo, just to keep the rain off. Um, and uh, the pollen is gathered from outdoors. Now, to 
Right, to go around, say, today and uh, emasculate the blooms of the mother plant. So, yeah. so that is actually opening the petals up, yeah, is that right? Yeah, and sort of exposing that's the stamens. Right. And then, yeah. so, pardon me, you then scrape off the male parts on that bloom so it doesn't self fertilize. Yeah. Right? Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you, that same day, harvest the blooms that are going to produce the pollen. Yeah. Uh, take them indoors, take all the petals off and the sepals and uh, leave them there till the next day and uh, providing it's reasonably warm conditions, the pollen will ripen and uh, you to, there are several ways of uh, harvesting the pollen from those um, blooms but best way I find is you hold the wine glass like that and the uh, what is it the part of the bloom, bloom yeah right? the parent yep. yeah yeah um, so all the petals removed and the sepals removed and the pollen's ripe now so you about that on the inside of the <laughs> glass with that sort of motion and uh, at first glance you can't see any pollen but you hold it up to the light in just the right manner and you'll see the pollen in there. Okay. Um, yeah. Years ago, even the big time professionals uh, used a camel hair brush and so on to brush it on the mother plant. Uh, but, uh, oh, as of quite some years ago now, they've cast all that aside and they just put their finger in like that and get the pollen on it and dab it on the top of the wow. mother okay. plant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and years ago, they used to put paper bags over the bloom that they put the pollen on and, and uh, twist them around the paper bag and so on, so it couldn't blow off uh, to keep the bees from Cross putting other the... pollen on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But now they don't even bother with that. No? Perhaps the bees make a good choice sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, so that happens in the uh, early December up to Christmas. And uh, I do go a bit beyond Christmas, but it's ideal to be no later than uh, early January anyway to give them enough time for the seed to ripen. Mm. Um, so, uh, then uh, when the seeds have ripened, the seed pod, you cut the seed pod off and it has uh, a label on it as to what the parentage was and you give it a number and uh, no, not a number at that stage. Um, just the cross, what the two parents are. And with the extremes are uh, some seed pods will only produce some one seed, say. But mm. then, then others, extreme, some will give you 30 seeds. Mm. And you wonder how they all fit in there. But... Um, then put them in the refrigerator for about a month uh, in plastic sealed bags. Um, now, they used to do that in Europe and Britain and so on, but uh, I visited uh, ha uh, Dixon in Northern Ireland uh, about two years ago now and they don't bother to even put them in the fridge now. Right. They just plant yeah. them right Straight away. Uh, I think yeah. what's behind that is winters at that latitude, 
uh, are cold enough to not yeah. need putting they're, them in. They're the already fridge. in the fridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're in the outdoor fridge. Mm. Um, incidentally, I might add, uh, Mr. Colin Dixon, when I arrived, he said, Oh, this is my final year of hybridising. And uh, he had just one plant in his glass house. I don't, I don't want to exaggerate, but my guess is there are about 300 blooms being pollinated on that one plant. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he tr pruned it and then trimmed it in such a way that it produced great numbers of very twiggy little shoots yeah. uh, uh, with a flower on it. And you've got those yeah. great yeah. numbers on it. Mm. Um, so then there's a lot of work after getting to that stage of putting the seed in the refrigerator uh, and uh, well even the really big hybridists uh, would in styrene boxes plant the seeds an inch apart and the rows inch apart. Okay. Um, and then they would rogue out the ones that were rubbish, but sometimes that wasn't the best because you could get several uh, all close together that did show some promise. Mm. So the ones that that uh, germinated first, they'd rob the ones that germinated later. Uh, so now what I'm doing is, and I believe some of the overseas people are doing, is in a little three inch pot, we put one seed per pot. Okay, keep them separate. And just, yeah, yeah. Uh, and with its num number on it, uh, which indicates what the cross is. What, what's what's the percentage of germination with the seed? Do they all germinate oh, or...? varies greatly. Does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah varies greatly. Okay. Um, so, you carefully tend those little three-inch pots with the seeds until they germinate. And then you keep an eye on them while they're making their first little bloom. And... You every day you go to the these little three inch pots, oh, and you might throw three or four or half a dozen out today, and the same tomorrow, and the same for the day after that. Mm. You keep keep doing that. It might only be about five or ten percent of them are deemed to be good enough to trial, and you'd put them in six inch pots, mm. and then you'd be throwing some of the six inch pots out because mm. they proved not to be good enough. So, so what, what would determine you throwing those out? Is it just that they're, they're like a weak plant? They've got, uh, you're spotting uh, disease on some of those little seedlings? Appeal of the it's bloom a, is one thing. Yeah. If it doesn't, that, the bloom doesn't have any appeal, it's no good doing anything with it. But in, but in a little or, tiny or, tube, or, how do you or, determine that when it's in which, such a... When it's in such a small tube, like a little yeah. three inch, how can you determine the quality of flower when it's, when it's oh, so small? good enough to... As it a guess, they'd say, no way will that be any good. But that other one, I pot up to a six inch and then mm. evaluate it in that. Yeah, okay. And Just the way it's growing and, and the way it looks and yeah, the colour. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the last lot I did, which was not, not as many as I've normally been doing, I threw out all the six inch pots. The lot. Yeah, yeah okay. the lot, yeah. You weren't happy with what you said? No. Okay. Nothing had potential yeah yeah and that happens and that's pretty disappointing i'd imagine when you get to that oh, yeah. stage it's yeah. uh, you know hoping that you're going to you know with, with some of the crosses you're doing you're expecting something i'd imagine yeah you know, you're, you're, you're you're striving good. for a particular style of rose good parents and don't then, necessarily produce good offspring <laughs> yeah sure no yeah. that's right yeah, yeah. So. so then so then after that after they become a, into a six inch oh, pot, yeah. then would you would you then bud onto rootstock yeah, and sort yeah, of try and select a bit of bud wood off that and mm. bud it onto a rootstock to evaluate still further yeah yeah 
And, th and that's where I've sort of come into it a little bit. I suppose I'm looking at some of these plants and, and you know, you, really you need three, four, five, six years to really see, and you want to be looking at a mature plant. You want to be looking at a plant that's most probably two or three years old. And, uh, and certain seasons will, some of these varieties will uh, perform very well. And then all of a sudden you'll get a particular season. We've had one right now that's quite wet where you, all of a sudden you start noticing a few problems. So. Um, you know, I, I think that you're generally working from, from the date of crossing to, oh. to make a decision. It could be yeah. six, seven, eight, ten years before you make a decision on whether you're actually going to release something to the market. That, that'd be right, I suppose, wouldn't yeah. it, Bruce? Yeah. And, uh, and you want to make sure that you're releasing a rose that's going to be around for, for many years. You know, mm. there's a lot of expense that goes into um, putting a rose out onto the market by, you know, that's protection and labels and then sort of building your numbers up and distributing those that that material to different growers around the around the country and uh, so you've got to try and make sure that what you're actually releasing is is good so uh, so yeah so Bruce what would be your favorite rose that you've bred to date to, or do you have one maybe Not, you don't have one or maybe you've got lots or several so if you can when people used to ask my late father that he'd say I have a different variety every day yeah I say because, something very similar to yeah so. it, yeah yeah, certain varieties will look good in these conditions, but no good in the conditions you have the next day. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, it can change a lot. So, but is there is there one that you do particularly like that you've bred uh, well, that's sort of a bit of a favourite? I'd imagine there would yeah, be. Yeah, I'd say my first release, uh, Shirley's Rose. Mm. It's a, a very satisfactory plant. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a big plant, but... Uh, a term we use sometimes is, oh, a certain variety, oh, no, we won't re release that because it grows like gum trees, you yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, it's a strong grow. Too yeah. good, yeah. yeah. Uh, and these days, a lot of the gardens are small gardens, so they don't want a rose in there that grows like gum trees, do mm. they? Um, but, to, you know, that... that, that that differs a lot. Like can, oh, can I just bring one thing up? And we, we talk about this a little bit. Our biggest selling rose at our property is a climber. And it's God. big. And it's got no perfume. <laughs> and it's got a name that... Uh, so you think, well, why would that be? Yeah. You know. So the trends don't always fit how you think that they should uh, fit sometimes. So, uh, um, But I, I, I can speak for Shirley's, and we've had it for a number of years now. And we sell a lot of Shirley's rose, yeah. and it's a lovely rose. Um, Back in the early 50s onwards for about 10 or 20 years, new colour breaks came on the scene. You know, vermilion. No one had ever seen a vermilion rose before. Mm. And, uh, well, the first was by name Superstar. And uh, I'd only just met my wife a couple of weeks before we went to uh, my neighbour's wedding and uh, Shirley had a corsage with superstar roses on, which got a lot of attention because <laughs> mm. nobody had seen, seen roses that colour yeah. color before. Yeah. Anyway, in jest I say that I think Shirley with her corsage of Superstar Rose has got more attention than the bride did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Which is not much of an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah, no, I believe you. Like, and, and that's what we're looking for in breeding, aren't yeah. we? You know, we're looking for something different. You know, we're See, looking there, for different there, colours. Uh... Right. So, Vermilion and Mauve Roses, mm. they don't, they'll never get a blue rose because uh, that's not in the genes of the parents. Um, so, yeah, the blue rose was never came about, but all sorts of mauves and colours around that, yeah. yes. And so they'd sell very well for a few years. And what else? Um, oh, ones that were, in effect, brown. Yeah, the chocolate colour varieties. Yeah, it's a lot of those. one yeah. was called brownie. Um, yeah. But they weren't very good growers, mm. and they faded from the scene. But they've improved, though. We've got some nice breeds of those varieties yeah, now. I've, I've got one in the trial grounds you could classify in yeah, that sort of colour. That but yeah. 
it's a, not a particularly good grower, but yeah. Um, yes. What else can we mention? I don't know. Well, I think you know. We've, you, well, we've, we've, we've mentioned this, but there's, there's you know the the what's evolving in the in the whole industry is it's and that's the nice thing about this industry, isn't it? Is that we're always seeing something different and something new, and all, all of a sudden something pops out that you know yeah. is something that we've never seen before well, in what the I industry. What I mention you know? is uh, each year the Rose Society put on a rose show in the Melbourne Town Hall. Sometimes this uh, rose show, particularly in the autumn, had so many entries that I couldn't fit them all in the Melbourne Town Hall and some had to go to the Lower Town Hall. Uh, and now we had all morning to stage the, our trade display and uh, it was at its largest, 40 feet in width and uh, about eight foot in height. Um, and this necessitated, oh, what here, I've got to think, think here now, uh, for several days before the show, there would be, say, three people picking blooms and then going into the shed and uh, they would be dethorned in the bottom four or five inches and a wire would be... Now, the wire had a semicircle on the top and that would go up under the calyx and then be closed. Yeah. Um, and then two, maybe three very fine wires attaching it to the stem mainly because most of the varieties in the 50s had weak necks. Mm. And um, I'll advance a little bit here to, you say, uh, 80s. I thought, oh, for it, something a bit different in our catalogue. Uh, I'll put in a, a few of the older varieties that had declined drastically in popularity or not mm. growing anymore. And I walked into the nursery headed for this area where these roses of 20, 30 years prior were. And the big difference hit me when I walked through the gate. It was because all the blooms were like that yeah. oh, on weak necks. Mm. So that took uh, several people's time to couple of days, maybe three, wiring all the roses. And, uh, right, so then on the day of the show, uh, there would be, one, well, before I was married, there'd be my mother and myself and uh, about three employees staging the show. Um, and we had to be finished by two o'clock because then it was open for to the public for uh, them to come in. But mm. prior to two o'clock, while judging was in progress, uh, we were not there. Mm. We were there, but very, mm. <laughs> very low profile. Um, and uh, so, oh yes, and business for mail order then was exceptionally good. We'd have two, three people attending to the queues of people that were wanting to put in Orders. an order for the coming winter. And uh, uh, the crowds in the Melbourne Town Hall to begin with, uh, oh, I might mention that while they were waiting for the show to open, they'd be about eight across, queuing up the steps of the to, Melbourne Town to Hall, get in. Right. and then down onto Swanston Street, along Swanston Street a bit, and up Collins Street, 
Uh, so it was very popular. Huge event. And mm. people would come in and say, oh, what's new this year, Mr. Brundtrett? Mm. Yeah. Um, so when we said, oh, we've got this Mo variety or a brown variety or a whatever, uh, that got a lot of attention. Mm. Something had never been seen before. Um, so the business was very good in the in the oh, in the mid to late fifties, right through the nineteen sixties. But sometime thereafter, it gradually diminished um, because when people come to see what's new this year so much, we're always badgered by. People coming up and saying to my father or myself, what's new this year, you know? I haven't heard anybody say what's new now for about 40 years. Mm. Um, but, there, but there is, like, you know, I think there is still a huge interest in new, new oh, varieties, yes. isn't there, you know? But, it's, uh, but when they're uh, not a new colour break, yeah, I suppose that so. is what was yeah. promoting the high level of interest, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Like, what we could also say is, like, a, like at the moment, I suppose, maybe, maybe mention, like, the, uh, the emphasis on what, what the breeding program is now, you know? And there's a, there's a huge swing to the way breeders are presenting their plants. Like, on, on the, I suppose, style is one thing, but the, the actual health and vigour of, of plants these days, which yeah. is a massive improvement in the industry. Yeah, well, um, in the early days, so long as it had a pretty face, yeah. that was enough. Sure. But well, now it's got to be more than that. Mm. It's how profuse a bloomer is it, and is it does it have a high resistance to black spot and mildew and all that sort of thing. And mm. such a high proportion of the roses sold now are plants that are blooming and in, in pots that go to the garden centres. Mm. Whereas before, people would, were uh, satisfied with just a, a description of what the rose was like. Mm. Now that's not enough. They want to see the yeah, rose. Yeah, they yeah, they want to see it. And but yeah. but, the, but the, the the quality of plants that are coming out these days is just so much different. Oh, yeah. You know, the, yeah. The, the, there's a huge improvement there. So well, yeah, it's high, high health is, is, is yep. if you want to yep. put it under that yeah. label. Um, yes. Is the main emphasis in the breeding program? I think. Oh days. yes. So it's, uh, now, so I, the quality of plants you're getting now are just so much better than what. I, they were, I'm you know. scaling back the amount of breeding I'm doing now, and I won't use as parents virtually anything that gets any black spot. Mm. It's yeah. got to be really at least ninety-eight percent free of black spot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Oh. When I was in Northern Ireland at uh, uh, Dixon's Roses, uh, Colin Dixon was showing me around, and uh, I might add that my wife and I visited Dixon's in 1976, and Mr. Dixon said, oh, sorry, I can't introduce you to my son, uh, he's away at boarding school still, right? Mm. He was 16 then. And when I got over there, what, about two years ago, he said, oh, I'm going to give the hybridising away now. I'm getting too old. <laughs> <laughs> so he was getting too old at 60. Yeah. But mm. when I, I couldn't see him before because he was still in school. Boarding school, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. In Western Europe now, most of the rose plants are not grown there. They're grown in Eastern Europe, where the labour costs are much lower and they're brought into Western Europe. Now, um, now what was I getting to there? Um, oh, yes, but breeding still going on in uh, Western Europe and Britain. And uh, each year they have a, they choose a plant that will be promoted by the growers, right? 
Mm. Uh, it goes under a name which I can't quite recall now. Uh, but he and I are walking down this row of roses in, oh, you know, plant, uh, plants four or five inches apart in nursery fashion, two rows deep, and it went for maybe uh, 100 yards or so, right? Something like that. And we're walking down, and I said, oh, they're all very clean foliage. And, you mm. know, in Northern Ireland there, they get black spot conditions every day. <laughs> mm, sure. <laughs> you know, and um, oh, I hadn't seen any black spot. And I said to Colin, I said, oh, look at that one, it's got black spot. Yeah, he said, I don't know why they enter them if they get black spot. <laughs> so uh, high health, as you put it, is yeah. now a very big... Uh, yeah, it's most probably the number one uh, yeah. uh, emphasis on, on the breeding program. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, if, it's got, if it's got fungal problems, it generally doesn't... Uh, yes, yes. It'll never make the grade. No. It? So... Um, look, again, um, it's wonderful having you here, Bruce. And look, thank you very much for, uh, um, for having a chat with us today about uh, you know, your, your history and, and, and what you've been doing over the many years that you've been involved in the industry. And uh, um, there's going to be a lot more Brundit roses that we're going to be seeing on the market over the next uh, number of years. So thanks, thanks very much, Bruce. Thank you, Brian. All right.